It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? I trust that you all feel that way as well. And uh, we're going to be looking today at uh, chapter 3 of uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And we'll be going through verses 1 to 7. Uh, The message today is the first of two, uh, dealing with the mystery of Christianity. If I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's inerrant and infallible and holy word. This is Ephesians uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 7. And let me uh, encourage you never, ever, ever to forget that uh, what we are looking at each Sunday when we come together is God's own word. He knows what we're reading. He knows what we're preaching through. And he can use that through his Holy Spirit to direct our lives. Paul the Apostle wrote this letter to the Ephesians. We'll begin in verse 1. For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it is now, has it been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Thus far, the words of today's Holy Scripture, you may be seated. Scripture reminds us the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that shall stand forever. In other places in Scripture, Jesus said it, the Gospel writers recorded it. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you would, just allow me to pray for us all. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight because indeed you are our rock and our redeemer. So God, uh, allow your truth and the clarity of your truth to sink deeply into our minds and our hearts today so that we can know what it is that you want us to do with this new information to grow closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in this letter to the Ephesians, Paul is uh, writing to exhort those in Ephesus to live exemplary lives uh, so that others could see the joy that was in them. He has uh, just finished telling them that they are no longer strangers and foreigners or aliens, that they are to be unified in their doctrine because they are now part of the household of God. Not only were they fellow Christians, but they were also to be construed as members of that household, all members of the same family, and beyond that, even part of the Lord's temple. It was as if each one of those recipients were to be stones. Peter calls them living stones used by God himself to leave a legacy for the world to see. Christianity is different. It is powerful. It is also mysterious. Follow along with me as we go back through the text. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can 
understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So you can see what's going on there in the background. There's a mystery that's unfolding. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. This is a lot of information in in seven short verses here. Here's a one thing we should not miss. Christianity is a veiled mystery to many, many, many people. When that veil is finally lifted by the Lord, they see. They finally and frequently respond. Let let me tell you about a, a, a recurring experience that's happened in my Christian life. When someone asks me to explain the gospel or to share the good news with them, I will almost always tell them, now what I'm going to share with you, you're going to swear that you've never heard it before, but you really have heard it before. As a matter of fact, some of you will say, uh, yeah, I, I, I heard what you were saying. I heard the words, but I didn't understand. For many today, Christianity is a mystery, something that has been hidden from them. And Paul really nails this home for the folks in Corinth when he writes in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians some famous words which Michael Plunkett shared with his Sunday school class just this morning. So follow along with me, won't you? Uh, This is uh, 1 Corinthians, you can follow along in your own Bibles there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18, all the way to chapter 2, verse 5. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the understanding of those who have understanding I will confound. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind, and the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. For consider your calling, brethren, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are so that no human may boast before God. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And we continue on to the first five verses of chapter 2. And when I came to you, brothers and sisters... I did not come as someone superior in speaking ability or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I also was with you in weakness and fear and in great trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. Today, we examine the mystery of Christianity, Paul's relationship to it, and then our own relationship to it. So let's go ahead and first look at the messenger of the mystery. Next, we'll look at the message of the mystery. And finally, the miracle of the mystery. Here's what we read in the first two verses. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, indeed, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Incidentally, the for this reason is the beginning of a parenthesis, which actually picks up again in verse 14 with the same words, for this reason. So Paul considered himself to be a prisoner of Christ a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles, a recipient of the stewardship of God's grace, a recipient of a mystery by revelation. Paul, as you know, was a zealous Jew who didn't believe in Christ as Messiah. God turned his life upside down and gave him a special calling. So let's think about that. These texts are not written out, but the title of them is in your sermon outline. So in Acts 9.15, that's where the Lord said to this man, Ananias, who was in Damascus, he said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 7 It was Peter who said, Men and brothers, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Of course, this passage is actually where, well, it's five chapters later than Cornelius, who Peter did bring the gospel to. In Acts chapter 15, verse 15, James says this at the council of Jerusalem. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is written, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind, now understand this, may seek the Lord. The rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, who are called by my name. James continued on, says the Lord, who does all these things? Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those, again, from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. So you're seeing this pattern. It's it's easy way to describe it is, obviously, God's will is for non-Jews to be in heaven. And the early church fathers, the apostles, didn't, didn't respond immediately in that direction. In Acts chapter 20, Paul says he was solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 22, 21, Paul says that the Lord restated his call on Paul exactly when he said, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. In Romans eleven thirteen, Paul says this, But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. It was clear to Paul that he was to serve whom? The Gentiles. 
This was his special calling. And then let's recall his commitment as well. And we'll see that in 2 Corinthians, and I think this should be in your sermon outline there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 15. It reads like this, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Now, now hear this. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. That's Paul's commitment to get the good news to the Gentiles no matter what. Well, next, let's see, the, let's see the message of the mystery that Paul was to bring to the Gentiles. And we'll see that in verses 3 to 6. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And this, folks, is an allusion to Paul's time spent in Arabia with the resurrected Christ. Uh, for those of you that are keeping score, uh, this is described in detail in Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 and following. And I'll read those with you. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Peter and remained with him 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. He continues on, he says, in what I'm writing to you before God, I am not lying. Then I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. It's as if Paul is saying, can you believe this? Can you believe it that God wanted me? Can you believe it that people couldn't believe it? Can, can you believe it now? Verse 4, And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit 
So Paul is saying something unusual is happening right here. And the gospel is going out exactly the way God said to the Gentiles as well. To be specific, he says, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Let's talk about the message of the mystery then. If you were to look up the verses that I've listed on your sermon outline, you would find that Genesis 12.3 and 22.18 and 26.4 and 28.14 all state that the Gentiles will be blessed by God. Now just a little aside here. I don't know how they missed that, but we still do the same thing today. We have our little hurdles that people have to go through. We make them join this way or that way. Okay, let's continue on. Psalm 72 shows us that Gentiles will bless God. That's very good. All the, vessels, the verses listed here in Isaiah 11, 12, and 49, 6, and 54, 1 to 3, and chapter 60, verses 1 to 3, make it clear that the Messiah will come to the Gentiles. And Hosea 1.10 and Amos 9.1 and the following verses clarify the fact that Gentiles will be saved by Messiah. Finally, Joel 2, 28 and 29 remind us that the Gentiles will receive the Holy Spirit. And the mystery is that the gospel is for all Jews and Gentiles. Now, if the word mystery or the definition of mystery, if it's understood as information which is made known to a select few, which was previously unknown, then we see that this mystery made known to Paul was that Gentiles are to be part of God's plan. Gentiles do not have to become Jews to be God's children. They have direct access. Now let me spell out the ABCs here uh, of it all. Gentiles are to be fellow heirs. And Gentiles are to be fellow members of the body. And Gentiles are to be fellow partakers of the promise. God tactfully but persistently drives this message home, first to Paul and then to the other apostles as well. Gentiles are no longer excluded. If you belong to Christ, you're part of Abraham's offspring, Abraham's spiritual offspring, heirs according to the promise. Gentiles are not to be second-class citizens, not to be viewed as in-laws or different or distinct relatives. In some way, they are fellow members, indistinguishable from all others. Every child of God is God's child alone. Even, even though I was an adopted child, there were many times when people would come up to me and say how much my adoptive father and I looked alike. Now, Peg and I have uh, assisted folks in uh, private adoptions. And what we've noticed in some of those private adoptions is that the adopted child, they don't really look like the parents, but their mannerisms are quite similar. They can pick up the same intonations and the way they react. And so, so I can see where people could say that. Well, listen, as people would say to me, you look just like your dad. We are heirs and fellow members and partakers of the promise. It's supposed to be that way with God and his adopted children. Well, we've spoken about the messenger of the mystery and the message 
of the mystery. Finally, let's speak about the miracle of the mystery. Here in verse 7, of which Paul says, I was made a minister. Can you believe it? According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. This is really easy for us to see now. It was a miracle that God trusted Paul. It was an absolute miracle that God trusted Paul with this mystery. Remember, Paul was a hater of the gospel, a confirmed sinner, a contributor to Stephen the martyr's death, and therefore an accomplice to murder. And God, in a way, said, that's my man. It was also a miracle that the the gift of God's grace was given to Paul. Remember, Paul clearly didn't deserve it. But a gift, a gift may be offered to anyone. We do not deserve a gift. We do not earn gifts. We receive them. It was also a miracle that God's power was at work through Paul. Paul saw God in his circumstances. After all, I didn't get blinded and knocked to the ground and hear a voice coming out of the clouds, but Paul did. I I didn't hear that voice speaking. That's true, I didn't. But if this mystery hasn't been revealed to you, then there's no real peace in your hearts right now as you listen to his words. Let me tell you about a time in my life when I knew for sure that I didn't know for sure. I uh, played football and rugby in college, and in one particular game, I uh, broke my nose. Uh, The uh, team physician said, uh, come to my office tomorrow and we'll look into it. So I uh, got one of my friends to drive me to the doctor's office. Uh, When we drove there, he parked uh, right in front of the the doctor's office and uh, I was in the passenger side and my friend was in the driver's side. We began to get out of the car and, uh, and we heard a screeching and a crash. And maybe a hundred, hundred yards behind us or something, one car had run a light or a stop sign and run into another car. And we saw the car careening toward our car. And I was uh, getting out, like I said, on the passenger side where there was a lawn there in the doctor's office. And the car hit the right rear of our car and threw me against the the hood of the car, taking the door off. And then I was thrust back onto the lawn and the car, the car that was in the accident kept, kept coming toward us, toward me until it stopped and it was just nudging my rib cage. Now you have to understand, I came from a denomination where I fully believed that if I could pray this paragraph prayer at the time of my death, I was going to go straight to heaven. And I had that paragraph memorized. Now let me tell you something. When I was under the car with the tire nudging up against my ribcage and the antifreeze from the radiator kind of dripping down. I thought to myself, I never had time for that prayer. I never had time. That's not going to work. Ask yourself as you hear this message, where do I fit in there? Where do I fit in? Do 
Do I know where I fit in in this picture? You are most likely a Gentile. Everyone's pretty much a Gentile today. The mystery is that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. People from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation will be there in heaven. And I would say that if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should reach out and receive this gift. You don't have to do anything except to receive the gift. Now, I would be naive if I let that go because you need to understand something. When you receive that gift, that means that God will come into your life and take over your life and make you the kind of person that he wants you to be. You'll live every day as a bondservant, just as Paul did, as a prisoner, as Paul did, by grace. For those of you that do know this Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I would suggest that you, you kneel and praise God every day until the day he calls you home, because he's the reason that you're saved. He's the reason that you have peace of mind today. Amen? Allow me to close in prayer. God, I do pray that you would take your truth and drive it home, Lord, and, and allow us, those of us who do know you, Lord, as Lord and Savior, allow us to grow closer to you, Lord, and to share this good news with others even today. And for those uh, few folks in the church, Lord, who don't know you at this time, I pray, Lord, that you would pursue them, that you would be that hound of heaven uh, so that they would know that, uh, that this plan that they have isn't going to work. What they do need to do is receive the gift. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.